Hello Zimbabwe and welcome. This is My Future, a platform where young people get to interact and speak to different policy makers, decision makers, all with a view to creating a brighter future, not just for themselves, but for Zimbabwe in general. Tonight I'm joined by two guests in the studio as well as a panel of different young people drawn from different parts of this country. The two guests tonight are Pastor Caroline Maposhere. She is a gender, sexual and reproductive health consultant. And alongside her is Mr. Jimmy Wilford. He's a young people and sexual reproductive health specialist. The panel that they will be speaking to is led by the two gentlemen and lady right in front of me here, Rufaro Maniepa, Samantha Monera and Macomborero. Moropa. Uh, clearly tonight's topic is about reproductive and sexual health, very topical issues when looking at young people in this country and also very topical in terms of determining their future. I will begin tonight's discussion by asking uh, Rufaro Maniepa purely because uh, he's got a question directed at Pastor Caroline Maposhere and because her son goes to the same school I thought that's perhaps a very good uh, point at which to begin. So Rufaro, you've got a question for the uh, pastor, please go ahead. My question is, a lot of the time, more often than most, um, parents find it very difficult and embarrassing to engage their children in uh, discussions and talking about sex or anything even involving sex. So what I would like to ask is, how would you advise parents to approach uh, their children in a manner in which they would both be comfortable with it, or even if they're not comfortable with it, to just have some grit to talk about this issue because it's very important for both the parents and the children. That's a very good question and it's a very good point to raise with parents. As a parent, knowing what other parents are doing and not doing, I really feel ashamed to be a parent living during these times where we are really not having one-on-one -on -one discussions with our children, just discussing even issues of growing up, not even talking about relationships, so, but just the changes that happen to a young person as they grow up. As you rightfully say, that I should sort of give a message to the parents. It's very important for the parents to give time and listen to their children and create trust so that when your child is facing problems or is abused, you would know about it. If we don't do it, Uncle Google is <laughs> going to do it. Teachers, and other people may do it. However, when those other people and peers do it, they then exclude our family values, uh -huh. which yet we want to instill in our children as parents. And I've talked to some young people who have said, you know, Auntie Carol, our parents only talk to us, which is very unfortunate. However, at times some parents don't even know what to say. They uh -huh. think you know it all. They think the teachers have told you at school. They think you will Google it, you know, on your tablet, on your phone, or whenever. At times, they are themselves not confident enough to say, where do I begin? What do I do? Or at times, they've messed up their lives and don't want to go back there and are afraid you might actually say, how did you handle your relationships when uh -huh. they probably know that they have failed? So there are a number of reasons why parents would fail that way. However, there are a lot of places where parents could go and be trained. It's, parenting is a skill. And parenting in this day and age where children are exposed to so much information, it's a challenge to parents, which we must admit that we have. Hence, we should actually seek other sources of information or seek other forums where we can have either support groups or be trained on how to approach the subject with our young people. Pastor and uh, also you, Jimmy, both of you, I suppose, uh, a very pertinent question raised there, but where these young people feel that, look, I am at an age where my friends are talking about these things or seem to know about it, but my parents are silent on it, uh, do you recommend that perhaps they should approach their parents? How do they go about it? Because you've spoken quite a lot to the parents, but as a young person uh, who is in the dark, what do they do? I would come in and say this is a shared responsibility. Mm. Uh, I think it's also a responsibility of the young people to create that friendship with parents. You know, we don't necessarily need to communicate with our parents when we are in need of money or school fees to check, and maybe to go there and submit your report. We need also to create that particular relationship with the parents. In as much as we are faced with situations where parents sometimes they don't spend time 
while at home trying to make ends meet. But it's also a responsibility of the young people to go and create that relationship with the parents and start those conversations. You know, uh, what is more important and what I want to emphasize is the family setup, where sometimes where parents again need also to create that environment where they can allow the kids to say anything, to discuss anything. But let's you move know? on the discussion. Uh, Samantha, I don't know if you have any issues to pose. Uh, I suppose perhaps as a girl child, maybe there are issues that you feel um, you also want to put across. I would like to ask, given the current community that we live in, you would find that as a teenager, it is very hard to come out and say that, um, mom, I'm pregnant, or dad, I'm pregnant. And once you come out and say you're pregnant, you face um, discrimination from your peers, from the community, from the church as well. So I, would, I wanted to ask directly to Mrs. Caroline, how would you advise that the church approaches such? How would they help us um, in a way that I will not resort to abortion as the first option? A church, a home, a community is a place of second chances. There are people who are already living lives of second chances. Firstly, the church. Jesus Christ himself was so forgiving and accepting that if we are actually true Christians, that would be the first place where somebody would be having confidence to pick up the pieces and go ahead with life. Therefore, they, they should be um, th that atmosphere within the church where someone would be uh, taken back and accepted. However, there is a responsibility that that young person should have where you are approaching everybody with this sense of remorse. Because every parent and every community member and every church member, when they see young people, they don't expect you know, them to get pregnant before they are ready and out of wedlock especially in our conservative Zimbabwe community, right? So when that happens, if you are going back to that same community, parents and church and whatever, and express that, you know, I failed you guys, and you know, then people are ready to hold your hand and walk with you, you know, so that you feel supported through that situation. I know this is not what's happening. Uh -huh. There's a lot of stigma when a child is, has done that. And that's why some people even resort to backstreet abortions. It's because as parents, at times, we are not supportive. Normally, it's because of the image that we want to bring out there, where I want to be seen as a good mother who has raised this daughter who does not do those kinds of things. And it's what people say. However, when people sit down and talk to their own children and understand what has happened, and you are also showing this remorse, then you should be supported. I know it's not happening, but and it's not easy even for the parents to accept and just move, if you move on and help you pick up the pieces. But ideally, that's the atmosphere that should be created. Pastor, let me stop you there. Uh, quite a number of issues have been raised and perhaps need to be uh, delved into a bit more, which we will do. We've got so many other children here who want to ask questions, who want to talk to you, and this is the platform where they're able to do that. So that and a whole lot more is coming your way when we return. This is my future. Don't go away. Well, thank you for staying with us. Welcome back. This is My Future. My name is Farai Mwakutuya and our two guests this evening, uh, Pastor Caroline Maposhere. She's a gender, sexual and reproductive health consultant. And alongside her, Mr. Jimmy Wilford, young people and sexual reproductive health specialist. Before we went to the break, there was a question raised by Samantha, which is a reality that unfortunately many young people face. Stigma, the fear to actually come and say, look, uh, I have fallen pregnant or perhaps I've, I've made a girl fall pregnant. Uh, Jimmy, I know you wanted to weigh in on that please go ahead yeah briefly just to say right now we are discussing about my future young people's future etc so i think it's, it's also important for us to emphasize again to, to young people that when you are talking of now the pregnant the, the challenges associated with them that is a result of a symptom of something you know? mm -hmm. as a teenager i think uh, we need also again to really uh, break the silence around issues to the sex and sexuality it's actually quite totally related to what we discussed earlier on when we are saying how can also parents create an environment where they can discuss with 
uh, with their kids, their children, uh, issues with sex and sexuality. Such that we will not have our, our teenagers being in such a position to say, I'm not pregnant. No, being pregnant is a symptom of something. You know, when you are talking about our future, let's also work for that, the, this future now. There is a lot that is going to come in our life. Very soon they'll be starting university. After the university, you'll be going to look for work elsewhere, or you're going to start something that is going to also create employment. So when you are talking about our future, let's also look at it backwards to say, these decisions I am making, how are they impacting to my future? Getting involved in relationships, having unprotected sex, what does that mean? Is it only about pregnancy or is it about other STIs, including HIV and AIDS, all those things? So we need also to look at it, this issue of pregnancy. Say, in as much as the society is supposed to accept and to come up with remedial uh, ways of dealing with this issue, there is also another responsibility from the young person to say, you need to try by all means to avoid finding yourself in such kind of a situation. I just want to pick up on that point that you've just raised, the responsibility on the young person. Uh, and obviously, I suppose, because you are much older, you will relate to appreciate where a lot of parents today, a lot of older people say the children of today are different. They are no longer as hardworking. Do you think that perhaps these children of this generation are getting, being given too much of an easy ride where we're saying, ah, you know, it is the dot-com generation, so if they make certain mistakes or if they do certain things, it's okay? Uh, or is it unfair for us to judge them based on the standards that uh, perhaps you and Jimmy had as you were growing up? It's unfair for anyone to judge the current generation based on what is happening right now, no technological development. It is. What is now more important is for us to, how can we harness the development within the ICT uh, field in the best interest of the young people? A teenage would, there are challenges that are associated by teenage would, whether we are in, in whichever generation, those challenges are there. So I think what we just need to do for those who are privileged enough to be in the decision-making position, they just need to contextualize what is happening right now. Then from there, make appropriate decisions to ensure that we guide our young people as they grow up in the best interest of the future. Mm -hmm. That can also help the country generally, and the young person in particular. Let me hand over to Marco Morero Moropa. Please go ahead, sir. Right, thank you very much. Um, a painful and very unfortunate truth is that um, the youth are engaging in sexual activity um, prior to the age where it was uh, usually set at. Gone are the days whereby um, sex uh, used to be used to happen long in their twenties. Um, my question is: Would you advise on the placement of condoms and other sex-related uh, materials in schools uh, or churches, for sure? What I know is every parent out there and every adult would want to believe that you know my child is not doing it. My child is a virgin. My child. Yet reality, like you say, is young people are sexually active. Personally, yes, I would advocate for having you know all the things that the young people need to make it safe for them somebody will say hey you now want to introduce these ideas in them that should go along with some education the education should not only be even in those schools but even at home the, this is my future we should have the intergenerational discussions what are the goals the goal setting should happen between parents and, and young people. And we discuss, my child, Makombore, why, who do I see 10 years from today? You tell me, oh, you see a successful lawyer. And I'm saying, what could stop you from getting there? And then you'd tell me, if I indulge in this. So whether condoms are placed there or not, if you are focused on your goal, which we have discussed, which I'm facilitating for you to get to, whether condoms are in your way or whatever, you should be able to make choices along the way and say, no, this is not for me. I am for this. I am for giving young people information, devices, and everything, and leave them to make the choices. Thank you very much, Pastor. I know we've got uh, a whole panel of other young people behind here. Well, I'm sure I've got burning questions, so let's uh, open it up to them. Uh, there is a roving mic. Uh, whoever's got the microphone, please tell us your name and uh, direct your question. Thank you. My name is Tendai Dion Mahundi, and I would like to direct my question to Mrs. Caroline. I think there's an increase in gays and lesbian in our community today, and I think that the church should help to intervene and solve this problem um, instead of judging these people and turning them away. I suppose maybe just to add to where she's coming from as well, um, uh, the church 
uh, is often seen as, you know, you're right or you're wrong. And if you are, <laughs> if you're not right, you're, you're wrong. And so maybe a, a lot of young people feel that, look, perhaps this is not the place for them because the rules are too strict or, you know, there's just too many boundaries. And if I step out of line, then, you know, I'm completely uh, wrong. Um, is there a role, uh, perhaps, uh, to follow up on what she's saying, that the church can play in saying, look, yes, you can make mistakes. Uh, yes, uh, you will mess up along the way. Uh, but still, you know, perhaps that's why so many young people aren't coming to the church. Right. We tend to look at life in binaries and boxes where things are either or, and yet life is not like that. Mm -hmm. Even when we live our lives, Although we have sections and ministries and whatever, Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Health, when I'm living my life, I don't say, now I'm in living Minister of Agriculture and start eating. Having said that, what I'm trying to say is we must accept that there are times when we don't understand certain things and when certain areas are not the binary that we think they are. Therefore, we should be more accepting and more accommodating and allow the young people to express who they are and express what is happening to them and even us understand what is causing that so that we can then begin to say is this a learned behavior or is someone born like that what is happening right now most people cannot answer that and yet they think they can solve that if there isn't that open relationship between parents even at churches with pastors or youth pastor or whoever that young person will not stand up and say i think i'm different Right? So unless and until that relationship and that path is clean enough for people to walk without judgment, we will not have them coming out, and that will continue. And that's unfortunate at mm -hmm. times that we take a position and judge and say this is wrong. It's because we live our lives in binaries and boxes, yet life is not like that. Mm -hmm. Life is very loose. So we should allow it to flow and find out what's happening. Indeed. Thank you very much, Pastor. We must uh, take a short break now. I know that the discussion is getting quite exciting now. There are a lot more questions and contributions that are coming. We'll get to those soon after we come back from this break. My future will continue shortly. My future continues. We thank you for staying with us tonight. We are talking about matters to do with reproductive and sexual health, as well as gender, which I'm sure will be coming up a bit later in this program. My sister Polite, who is part of this panel, has got a question that she would like to pose. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is that are there any programs that the churches do in order to disseminate information on child-dated families on the issues of sexual reproduction? Yes, um, again, when we talk of churches, it's not a homogeneous group. <laughs> they are diverse. Mm -hmm. And uh, however, most churches do have youth programs. Uh, and again, even in those youth programs, some may not specifically talk about child-headed uh, families, that is to say, where young people are responsible for families and responsible for being uh, breadwinners but a number of churches where they have a pastoral care section, um, they would take care of that. However, I, I would not be able to say all of them are addressing that particularly. Although, I guess when they say, oh, young people, we have a youth program, I'm sure they assume, which is very wrong, that they should assume that even young people are a homogeneous group when they are not. Because we have young people who are you know, heads of households who actually need a different program because they have different challenges from the other young people. Some may not be taking care of that. And I guess it's one area that as parents, as church leaders, we need to look at. Thank you for bringing it up. I'd love to hear your inputs on, uh, we've just spoken about child-headed families, but uh, early child marriages, which unfortunately the statistics in this country are quite high. Uh, it is quite alarming. Uh, in your view, what do you think it could be done to, to address that? And where, where do you think the problem lies? Yeah, I think maybe my, my, my intro on that is 
we need to also to look at it from a policy perspective. There is need to really realign our marriage law in our country, mm. where we can have a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old uh, going to get married under the what you might call custom law, maybe in front of a traditional leader, say, I have allowed them to get married. Then in terms of uh, going to court, you need maybe a specific age, it is even say a young lady can get married at 16, a young man can get married at 18, it is we need to realign those laws, uh, those laws as a point of departure. So that everywhere, everyone, marriage is treated the same. Say, mm -hmm. if you are marrying a minor, this is a rape. It's not mm -hmm. defined as such. And it clearly stated in our policies at constitutional level, then that cascaded down to every, to every facet of our society, including uh, the traditional leaders themselves, taken through that kind of a reality to say, if you are in your, in your community, in your village, if you are to allow a child of this age getting married, that's unacceptable. But a, a, do we need a law? Because a child is a child. A 13-year-old, even if the law says, uh, if there's no law about it, a child is a child. Do we really need these laws for, for people to know that this is right or not? Or Definitely not? we do need laws. We do need laws, laws such that if somebody is to go and get married to that particular person at that age, then if you are saying you have done, you have done wrong things, what, what measure are you using to say you have done wrong things? If there is no law, what measure are you using? If you are going to stay, if he argues, say no, I, I, we agreed, we got married because we agreed. So there is no law for you to be used to, for you to use as a measure, to say, as a benchmark to say according to this law, what you have done is very wrong. For somebody to say, I went to my chief and I got married to her at 14 years. Or the parents came, I done this work for them. I've been skip, staying staying here with them and keep looking after this fam this family this. Uh, the, the, their their cows, it is they've given me their daughter to, to get married to or at whatever age. If the law says that is also wrong, we need also to we can we can easily deal with that kind of a case. So we need we need to realign our laws. This is a point of emphasis to say in Zimbabwe, for instance, we need to realign our marriage laws such that marriage is defined the same way in Arare, in Blawayo, in Chivi, in Mausekwa, it must be defined in the same way. Mm -hmm. It is seen in the, in, in the same perspective. Okay. Uh, before you come in, uh, uh, Pastor Carolina, uh, th there is a, an issue that I think we need to touch, the, the issue of gender, because you're a gender specialist yourself. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time when I discuss or engage with people on gender, there are two things that come up. The first one is obviously the biblical one, where people uh, cite the Bible and say, uh, the woman shall, is there, the father is the head of the house, and the mudzimayim batsir. And also some people point out that, look, to address these gender issues, we must start at this age with the young people. By the way, we raise our sons mm -hmm. and the way we raised our, our daughters to know that, you know, this is, these are the gender issues, these are the gender dynamics. Do you think that is being done enough uh, to, to, to let these children know, to empower the girl child, to educate and, and make the boy child aware? And also just your thoughts on the biblical issue. <laughs> we are not doing enough, unfortunately. And at times, home, church, we are the institutions that are perpetuating gender imbalances by even the language we use. For instance, if a young person, let's say, you know, my son here leaves his uh, plates on, 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 not putting them back after eating, leaves them on the table. If you hear someone, maybe even a mother, a, a, another woman, saying, this child is going to grow up thinking a wife is there for Kundisim Zirandiro. The <laughs> language, the stereotypes that we put even in the way we talk and the way we raise the children makes them grow up with this mind where they don't respect each other. Or they, therefore, we are not doing enough. Uh -huh. Yes, we should catch them young and even begin to say the right thing, the, the, the correct language. For me, I don't know of a God who supports oppression of another person. He is a God of love. Even when he says, you know, uh, most people are very keen to quickly quote the scripture in Ephesians where it said, wives, submit to your husbands. They don't finish to say this husband is likened to Christ who died for the church. It's very easy for me to submit to someone who loves me. And this submission is nowhere near oppression. When I'm told to submit to my husband, 
I'm not told to be his servant. I'm not told to be his doormat. I'm told, you know, to just submit to his love because he's loving me like Christ did. We tend to quote scriptures out of context. We tend to quote scriptures to suit our situations. Therefore, I don't think it's biblical to perpetrate gender inequality. People quote these scriptures out of context. That's not what was meant to oppress women when they say, wives, submit to your husbands. Some people have even gone as far as to say, look, by separating chores and duties as we do, cooking for girls and sweeping, boys do these sort of things, that is also perpetuating it. Do you agree? Very quickly. Well, gender is socially ascribed. In some societies, cooking and whatever is not just for women. Mm -hmm. Whoever is warm first is the one that does the cooking. You could have a, a husband who does the cooking in a home. So that those are socially ascribed roles, which are not universal, which mm -hmm. have nothing to do with sex. Pastor Caroline Maposhere and uh, Mr. Jimmy Wilford have been our wonderful guests this evening. We must end the discussion here only because we're out of time. And I'd like to thank this panel of young people who've engaged with you. I think they've been very, uh, you know, topical, very relevant and pertinent questions that have been raised. And we certainly hope that it's added value uh, and will perhaps go towards shaping policy going forward uh, as we try to secure a brighter future. Thank you for coming through. And that does it for this edition. My name is Farai Mwakuti. I'll be back again next time. Be sure to join me then. It is my future. And it is a wonderful evening to you. Good night.